Yeah, so um, I'm just going to throw out a few statistics here and, and uh, things that I thought were very interesting about uh, just the adoption of the container space and, and Kubernetes. Um, so first off, uh, just DockerCon, I got struck by the numbers of, of applications that were uh, containerized today and the number of things that were happening. Uh, just uh, such an active space. Uh, and uh, Datadog uh, actually had a, uh, an article where they talked about the adoption over this past, just the past one year and the increase in the number of uh, um, Docker uh, images that were being used in uh, production. And right scale, very much the same. And I like this metric because I felt like this targeted very directly an enterprise space. So, um, but then the one that really uh, really impressed me was uh, uh, from the CNCF survey where it looked like with just uh, just native adoption of uh, Kubernetes about 63% of those workloads were ending up on AWS. So looking at that information and, uh, and a strong effort that we've had over uh, quite a long time now with Red Hat, we were working on uh, putting together more of a picture for what uh, OpenShift looked like. And Kubernetes was getting this uh, wider adoption across not just enterprise business, but a lot of mid-market business and uh, uh, a, lot of a lot of strong enterprise businesses. So we knew that OpenShift was being adopted, and there were a lot of customers that uh, we were hearing about and customers that we knew talking to like Amadeus and then uh, we saw you know multi, uh, hybrid environment strategies like the one at Schiphol um, and adoption by uh, groups at Samsung um, for OpenShift. So what sets uh, the AWS uh, environment apart? We think that's uh, the security model, um, just the number of services that are available uh, for integration and um, the experience. We have millions of active customers every month. Uh, the global footprint, being able to deploy and go global in just minutes. Uh, <clears throat> the integration of uh, new tools and new technologies like artificial intelligence, just right there. A growing ecosystem, uh, specifically with partners, partners that are already collaborating with uh, Red Hat as well. So, working over the past uh, year or so, um, this was announced at Summit that we were working on uh, an integration of the, the uh, open service broker API uh, through our collaboration with Red Hat. And <clears throat> in our joint work, uh, we put together a group of uh, services that were natively available to Red Hat OpenShift customers uh, through the, um, the OpenShift console. Uh, that work was, is built around the OpenShift Ansible service broker. And uh, the collaboration work we did there was that uh, CloudFormation templates were created. And then uh, in the framework of the OpenShift Ansible Service Broker, those are deployed on behalf of um, the, the uh, developer. So um, you've heard Paul Mori talk about this, right? So, so we wanted uh, the, the, the conversation to change. Normally, a, a developer would have to ask an operations person to uh, retrieve specific uh, products or services for their use in their, in their uh, uh, organization or their, pro their project. And, um, and we wanted to make sure that this was a seamless uh, practice built or uh, seamless integration that was built on the best practices uh, in those CloudFormation templates. So that we were um, using Ansible and CloudFormation in tandem to provide a way to not only stand up those resources, but then to 
um, cleanly remove them when that uh, resource was no longer necessary. So that was the focus of, of the work that we did here uh, in our collaboration. Anybody can stand up an S3 bucket, right? But, uh, but can you make sure that when, uh, when you're finished with it, you remove it? Does it feel like it's native in your OpenShift environment? So a lot of that work went into um, building a, 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 an immediate user experience so that not knowing everything about the command line, you might be able to use those service brokers immediately from the console. So I'm proud of this photo because it shows that a lot of this work was done using OpenShift Origin too. So there were 10 services that we focused on. So if you'd heard uh, any of the open service broker API discussions early on, they talked about one of the first uh, surfaces for attack was the database. So RDS, or our, the Amazon Relational Database Service, was one of our uh, uh, first, first projects for adoption. So um, early examples of the open service broker in, in action uh, show uh, the uh, RDS MySQL being used. But then other analytic services like Athena, um, Amazon EMR, and uh, Amazon Redshift all have uh, become part of our first grouping of tools available or uh, exposed today through the service broker API. So <clears throat> where are all the rest? That's what you want to know. Well, we, want to, we do want to eventually, you know, in the fullness of time, we would like to see all of those services in the open service broker. Um, but we would really like to work on them in the order that is uh, most efficient for your, your use. So we're looking forward to getting feedback on what should be next in the adoption line. So we think this offers you uh, incredible agility inside of the, or, uh, of the, um, uh, the infrastructure. So we'd like to see uh, how you use this and get more, go, get more detail. You may have noticed that I had just a few statistics. The reason I don't have any statistics that show OpenShift is because I need to hear more information from the users. I can't see what you're deploying. I can only see that it's been deployed. I know there are millions of containers out there, millions of images that are being deployed. And I'm sure there, there is a very large number of OpenShift deployments out there. And I'd love to hear more and more feedback from you about how you're using uh, Red Hat OpenShift or OpenShift Origin in the environment. You have a global footprint. You can deploy pretty much anywhere. Um, we feel like we have a great shared security model, so uh, from, the, from the instance up, from the host up, we know you're using OpenShift and you're using your own tools to uh, secure your environment, and we're handling that uh, from the instance down uh, with uh, multiple industry certifications and uh, best practices for security there. And again, this partner ecosystem that we have includes uh, basically everything that's in the uh, the um, the Red Hat suite, but also uh, we have thousands of partners who are there, both technology partners who are uh, adding uh, uh, software and uh, machine image uh, products and services inside of AWS, but we also have consultancy partners who are adding value on top of uh, services like OpenShift, and I'm sure there's some consultancy partners here in the room who can, uh, who can deploy OpenShift as well. But one of the things that we wanted to do for new users is to find a way for them to, without having to be an expert in Amazon Web Services, uh, you remember, I remember Telus saying, the gentleman from TELUS saying that they had only a few people inside of their organization who 
uh, were AWS experts. Um, I'm sure they only had a few people who were OpenShift experts as well. But we want to make sure that we're empowering people in organizations where they have neither or one of those expertise uh, in a very quick way. So uh, inside of Amazon, we have uh, the AWS uh, Quick Start team. And the Quick Start team is built, by, or it's made up of uh, partner solutions architects, similar to myself, but uh, also uh, a whole host of people out from the community who integrate and collaborate on those, uh, those quick starts so that they can understand better uh, how they run and make sure that they run in the best possible way. And we wanted to make sure that uh, customers could quickly and efficiently deploy an OpenShift environment of their choice for experimentation. And then with a single click in, in the CloudFormation console, roll back the entire uh, implementation. So this, this work, this represents basically the architecture that gets deployed. This architecture is based upon the Red Hat reference architecture, and we worked pretty closely with uh, Scott Collier and his associates from the Red Hat reference architecture team, and they in turn worked uh, in tandem with the OpenShift online team uh, to find best practices for deploying uh, OpenShift in AWS. And that included some interesting things like uh, leveraging the, elas the elastic load balancer uh, as a way to um, balance load uh, for the application nodes and uh, also f to provide a front end for uh, applications that are deployed as, uh, within your projects. So uh, you'll see on here that we used uh, serverless functions. We used the serverless function to ensure that we were getting the SSH credentials across to each one of these individual nodes. Uh, and, and we, we auto-generated those credentials. And the reason we use that serverless function outside of, of the, um, the OpenShift environment was because that gave us an opportunity to do the full cleanup. So we're deploying that stack. That stack is fully functional. But then the wrapper around that is uh, native functionality. So with this, you can stand up your own environment. So we've iterated over several versions of uh, OpenShift right, within the Kubernetes family. And, and uh, we started with 3.2. We went to 3.3. Uh, we were using a uh, partner to do some of that work. And at 3.3, we made the decision that the collaboration work, the collaborative work that we did in, with the Red Hat, directly with the Red Hat OpenShift team, the Red Hat Ansible team, and uh, the Red Hat Reference Architecture team was much more valuable. So uh, in the OpenShift 3.6 version, we released that uh, together, and, uh, and that became uh, our standard. So that's still around today. So looking forward, um, our hybrid team is going to carry this, uh, our partner hybrid team is going to carry this into the OpenShift 3.7, where we'll incorporate the AWS Service Broker uh, some native logging and metrics, and uh, change some things about the way that uh, uh, that we use uh, Route 53 for DNS. And uh, one more thing that I'm really excited about, which is uh, we have a best practice for scaling out uh, nodes that was put together by the Quick Start team. So. Uh, I say quick start team, but really this is one of the great things about uh, the scaling model. This is for scaling nodes. So we're, we're not just scaling in for, uh, the, the application nodes, we're actually scaling uh, the master nodes. So if necessary, we can do both in, in a self-healing kind of fashion. Just can't lose that CD. <laughs> so, um, the, the other thing about this work is that this, this commit I've pointed to on the, um, or the pull, pull request that I've, I've uh, pointed to on the slide, this was done by Andrew Glenn, who is one of our uh, support engineers. So 
not only is the Quick Start team collaborating with members of support, but support has also built a community of practice around OpenShift and is getting a much better understanding of how to, how to work with it. So uh, the, the, um, the community of practice is starting to extend out into, uh, into the organization uh, as a whole, and that is, uh, I think, very exemplary of a strong commitment that we've made over the past year to ensure that we have better Red Hat support um, all the way around. So, um, working with, uh, with all these teams and with the services around this in the CloudFormation templates, uh, I think we're building better practices. Uh, the OpenShift uh, team we work with, we, work, we typically commit to, to repositories and GitHub, and we have very much a social experience where we're talking about what it is that we're doing. We're, uh, we're passing back and forth uh, communications around uh, what we think are the best, best next steps. And, um, and then we're, we're passing a lot of that information over in front of the Ansible teams and letting people like Ryan Brown uh, give us their suggestions so that we can meet some of the demands. So some of the interesting demands we, we found in, uh, uh, in building the autoscaling models were that uh, with our lifecycle hooks, we had about four minutes to finish our job, and that didn't necessarily always uh, gel with the, with the time necessary for the Ansible scripts to, to play out. So <clears throat> in using those Ansible scripts, we, or in improving those Ansible scripts, we worked with the Ansible team, the Red Hat Ansible team, uh, to provide their feedback and improve those OpenShift Ansible scripts. Um, <clears throat> we're using CloudFormation templates as a basis for the quick start. We're using uh, identity and access uh, management to, to do fine-grained security around those uh, uh, specific uh, specific elements of the of the environment so that we can you know maintain uh, the least privilege uh, we're using the virtual private cloud to ensure that the in, the the deployments that we're doing are as localized as possible and non routable where necessary but routable where where you require your applications to be exposed specifically through the ELB and then we're using serverless functions, na our native for serverless functions, uh, to support the deployments. <clears throat> so, um, if you're really interested, now I'm going to pay the bills for a minute. <laughs> if you're really interested in doing a proof of concept for this, we would like to, ha to, to help you with that and to participate in, uh, in our uh, POC program. Uh, we're doing this jointly with the, uh, the Red Hat team and the AWS North America Solutions Architects are our full first point of contact. So if you can, if you're interested in, uh, in, in doing a deployment for yourself, uh, let us know and we'll, we'll work with you to ensure that you have uh, everything that you need to get started, credits for your deployment and uh, temporary entitlements. And with that, that's, that's uh, all I have to say today. Yeah.